you know, if there was maybe a, a human error aspect, that could have happened to anybody because the system yeah. allowed for it to happen. So it's less about, you know, Ashley's bad code caused the incident and more like, why could bad code get to the point where it broke this system? Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the DevSec Voice. I'm Erica Dietrich, your host, and today we have Ashley Sawatsky here with us today from Rootly. Uh, Ashley is an expert in incident management and communication with a special focus on the SaaS world. Uh, she has a crazy cool career history, in my opinion. Um, so while handling escalations and guest complaints as part of Disney's guest experience team, uh, she discovered a passion for turning negative experiences into positive ones. And don't we need more of that? <laughs> she went on to become a founding member of Shopify's incident response program, where she oversaw the processes, tools, and communications uh, related to their rapid growth. By the end of seven years at Shopify, she led the incident communications team and was responsible for critical incident communications across the organization. And now she works at Rootly as a senior incident response advocate, where she engages with SRE and incident response communities. And she's consulting with the world's largest tech companies, including Cisco. So we're very happy to have her with us today. Thank, Thank you so you. much for being on, Ashley. Thank you, Erica, for the awesome intro. I'm like blushing a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, everybody who comes on here already has an amazing bio, but I feel like I have to like WWE the bio, like, ah, oh, next, you know, Get really hype people up. Um, and I only invite really smart and cool people on this podcast. So, you know, people need to know that you're awesome. Um, <laughs> But anyway, jump, I just want to jump into the questions. We got to talk a little bit before this started. Um, as I mentioned, you've had an exciting, versatile career journey, which is also how I like to describe my career journey. <laughs> um, you even got business, degrees in business and PR. So what inspired you to work in these different capacities? And what advice do you have for viewers who would like to shake up their current career trajectory? Yeah, I would say... Um... My career has been one of those things where the titles and, you know, anything like that has sort of just followed the work. I feel like I have just gone towards the problems that I find most interesting, mm. that energize me, and, you know, whatever title I end up having tends to follow. Even, you know, you talked a bit about my experience at Shopify. Um, incident communications lead was a title that was uh, how would you say it, like backwards facing for the work that I had already been doing, I kind of uh -huh. known um, across our, our engineers and SRE team and all of that as like the person to bring in when something is really wrong. And I was doing it informally um, from a, a much broader role that I was in across customer support. And my role just kind of naturally evolved into that. So I'd say like, if there's something that you find exciting and energizing, um, just do that work. and probably you'll turn it into something that becomes a full-time job. I think every, almost every job I've had in tech has been a job I kind of made up and then it became. <laughs> <laughs> I love too, that you mentioned that you gravitate towards problems because that is a little bit the way I've described it to people too, is I'm a problem solver. It doesn't matter what the problem is. You assess the problem, you learn what you need to, and you go solve it. So it's really just a matter of, are you interested in solving it? Yeah, exactly. I love a good can of worms. I, I don't know, for whatever reason, I've always been the person who, when I see something really wrong, I just like, I'm like, let me try it. You have to, yeah. yeah. It's like an itch. Yeah, yeah. That's funny. And do you face any self-doubt, you know, like, you know, because I imagine because you've been in so many different situations that like sometimes you might get into a situation where like, oh, crap, I've never done this before. Like, how do you handle that? Oh, constantly. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think something I learned at some point, maybe in my first like real leadership role, is that actually no one knows. Like no one actually yeah. has me. Here. And I, <laughs> I always was waiting for this like magic moment where I would feel like I just I knew the answers. And you know, you go to school and you learn a bunch of stuff and you leave school and you're like, I still don't really feel like I know the answer. And all the time I'm in situations where I'm faced with a problem and I don't know what to do. Uh, 
So I try something or, you know, good old phone a friend. I have people, um, I'm lucky through the work that I do, especially now at Rootly, that a lot of my job is talking to other people in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, it's such an amazing thing to have as a resource when you're facing a problem. There's so many people that I would think to, you know, hey, can we have a quick coffee and I can talk through this like problem that I'm trying to solve? Um, so yeah. <laughs> That definitely helps having people that you can actually ask things to. Um, no, that's fantastic. I love the way that you explain that. And um, I feel like that's a great uh, engineering mindset as well in general is, you know, you just have to have confidence in your ability to solve problems and, you know, go, go tool up, go get help. Yeah. Um, so it's fantastic advice, I think. <laughs> um, so I did learn again, that one of your areas of expertise and a recent subject of some of the talks you've been giving is post-incident learning. Now, we have a pretty wide array of viewers here at DevSec Voice. So for people who might not be familiar, could you explain what post-incident learning is and why we do it? Yeah, post-incident learning is, you know, when all the dust settles after you've actually resolved the incident itself. So, you know, you've stopped the bleeding, so to speak. The impact is no longer happening. How do you take steps to make sure that, A, you actually understand what happened? Because anyone who's been in incidents knows it's chaotic. A mm -hmm. lot of times you're doing the best you can with the information you have. You might not even have all of the time and resources that you need to fully understand the breadth of the issue. You might be more focused on just like, how do we like put a tourniquet on this? You know, mm -hmm. do we need to fail over um, to get to like a healthy you know, server region so that we can just get the system back up, whatever it is. Um, so the first part of post-incident learning is really like, do we understand what happened? Like, can we validate the data that we have, the scope of the impact? You know, is there any downstream impact that we maybe didn't even realize we have to clean up after the fact? And I think that part gets overlooked a lot um, because people just think of post-incident learning as like your root cause analysis or retrospective, mm -hmm. whatever you use. Um, so I'd say that's the first part, validating. Do you know what happened? From there, reflecting and understanding, you know, what you've learned. And I am more of an advocate for like a broader approach to this, not necessarily just nailing down the single root cause, um, but more looking at, you know, what could have gone better? What actually went surprisingly well? And maybe we got lucky. A full um, reflection across the entire incident, not just the technical you know, aspects of what went wrong and how it was fixed, but also how we communicated, how we worked together, like how efficient we were. Um, and then finally, from there, I think the last part of post-incident learning is how you communicate what you've learned and done to uh, yeah. hear it. You know, and, and hearing you explain how you um, prefer to approach it too, it kind of reminds me of the, you know, instead of like looking at who's to blame, like, oh, who did we learn messed this up somehow? Like, looking at the big picture and looking at both the positive and the maybe negative. Yeah. The who's to blame thing. I mean, you know, blameless retros are a popular approach that have been around for a while. I totally agree with blameless. And I think when I first heard it, I was skeptical because I thought <laughs> if you're not finding a, a reason or a cause, then how are you learning? But it's more about like understanding that, you know, an individual who, you know, if there was maybe a, a human error aspect, that could have happened to anybody because the system yep. allowed for it to happen. So it's less about, you know, Ashley's bad code caused the incident and more like, why could bad code get to the point where it broke this system? Sure. And um, I guess in a, in a practical sense, um, what does that look like um, in order to fully understand comprehensively the problem and to communicate it as much as maybe you could speak to it in a general sense? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, validating that you actually understand the full breadth of impact can look like listening to your customers. A lot of the time, it's like just pulling the data and getting into those dashboards and really making sure that what you're seeing reflects your understanding of the issue. Mm -hmm. but then there's, I think the really important part is the retrospective process where you actually talk about it as a team um, and you really dive into what happened. Why did it happen? Why did that happen? <laughs> Getting as deep down into the whys as you can so that you understand like at a deeper level what went wrong. And then sometimes like you're going to find action items that are actual things that you can implement to make your system more reliable. And I think that's great. But I also think it's okay if the action items that come from a retro are like 
we're going to share this experience internally at an engineering all hands. And we're just going to talk about what it was like, or we're going to use this to communicate better next time we have an incident, because we realize that, you know, our comms team has no understanding of what's going on in yeah. the liability infrastructure team and have no idea what to say. Like there's so many things that can come out of it. So uh -huh. like talking about it and communicating both internally and externally. I think like now more than ever, especially when there's a major incident, people like your users and even sometimes the general public, like we all saw the crowd strike incident. Yes. Yeah. Expect an explanation. So that's something that you should really think about as early on as you can. Like, how are we going to explain what happened to people so that they can actually understand? Do you think that, have you seen in your experience a common challenge when it comes to either the understanding piece or the communication piece? I, I know that communication gets talked about a lot. Yeah, the communication piece, I think, is really challenging. It's always hard to get up on a big public forum and say, like, we screwed up. And here's the exact details sure, yeah, of why yeah. we screwed up. Um, and people are naturally, it's like hindsight is 2020. You're always going to get the people who read it and think, like, how could you be so stupid? Or like, what is <laughs> that they made? They don't even test their software. Like, I think don't let that make you afraid because the people who really understand it and like want to read it in earnest will appreciate the transparency and mm -hmm. as a whole it makes all of us better when we share mistakes openly like every software company will have an incident at some yeah. point no one is above it um so being transparent i think is really important but i do think there are limits and you know it's very case by case you don't have to share every single detail, but understanding like, what are the details that are actually beneficial that people can learn from um, mm -hmm. and how to use that to build trust rather than like erode it further after an incident? No, that's exactly what I was going to ask about building trust. <laughs> I imagine is how, how much detail do we need to uh, share in order to build that or maintain that trust at least? Um, no, thank you so much for detailing that. Um, and I know in your talks too, um, let's see, you, you break down specifically, I'm, I'm pulling a quote, I think here, that, 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 in, that uh, sorry, how to create incident response programs that build consistency and alignment while leaving room for judgment and agility. So um, you, you talked about how a, a little bit of this is case by case. I imagine that kind of plays a factor in, in this quote you've pulled, that I've pulled for you here. Um, in your opinion, what obstacles prevent instance response teams from striking? that balance between consistency and alignment while leading from judgment and agility. Yeah, I think one of the mistakes that I see a lot, at least in my opinion, this is a mistake because I've never seen it actually work. It's like one of those things that seems okay in theory, but then falls apart in reality, which is incident response, like playbooks that are very prescriptive to a specific situation. Like the, okay. uh -huh. the if this, then that. Follow this exact procedure when this breaks and everything will be fine and it will be fixed and <laughs> communication template, I think is the wrong approach. I think it's one of those things where, you know, what's the old saying? Like planning is great, but plans are useless. That's like, oh yeah, yeah. But that's really what it comes down to. I think exploring specific scenarios is worthwhile. But I don't think creating these like very prescriptive plans for the incidents you think you're going to have is the way to go um, because the nature of incidents is they're unpredictable. It's never going to go the way you think it's going to go. Your known knowns are one thing. What's actually dangerous is your unknown unknowns, the things that are going to break that you yeah, never right, right. expected. Um, and that's really where incident response gets challenging. So something I recommend people do is look at it at a different level and think like how can you shortcut decision making um, mm. allow for it rather than trying to eliminate decision making i think that's kind of what it comes down to is people approach incident response as like how do we eliminate the need to make decisions and just answer it ahead of time it's not going to work you have to like have that human critical thinking and decision making based on the context of the scenario even if you did have the exact same incident if it happened two different times you're in two totally different contexts. What people are talking about is different. The ways people might be relying on you are different. So it just doesn't work. So I really advocate for things like, do you have clear um, trade-offs around like an example I like to use? Say you you have a platform that services 100,000 users. 
certain one user is taking the platform down through some sort of action. Do you take that user down to restore service? What if that user is your highest paying customer? Like those are the type of decisions that are going to be really challenging in the moment that you can create some sort of heuristics around um, based on your company values and how you run your business. Um, so that's like a very long winded answer, but I think no, that's, that's perfect because I've never thought of it that way. I mean, I, I think that I have, uh, I mean, I, I kind of am at the intersection, right, of development and security, but I've always heard of it described up that way in almost like a cookbook sense of, you know, <laughs> these ing if you see these ingredients, you know, you, you handle this way. Um, so I guess with these heuristics you're talking about, it makes perfect sense. Um, are these things that there are standards around or exist already, or is this kind of a movement to to move towards short um, shorting the decision making process? That's a really good question. I think like in a very broad sense, there probably are some common, you know, ideas of how this should be done. But the way that I describe it, I usually advise it to be pretty company specific. Like think about mm, your okay. business and how you want to reflect those through incident response and how you want to make decisions that might be murky, suddenly really clear for your responders. Okay. No, that makes sense. And I, and I imagine that some of the pushback on that is maybe just, uh, you know, it takes time to, to develop company specific heuristics. Am I right? Yeah, definitely. And the, the effort around it change over time, you know, yeah. what you might do at one stage of your company's growth might be totally different later on as you scale. Um, so do you have any, I don't want to spoil your, your, what you talk about in your talks, but besides creating these heuristics specific to your company, are there any other recommendations you have for, for balancing uh, consistency with agility? Uh, practice, do game days, Oh, do practice, pins, tabletops, whatever it might be, actually practice in a safe to fail environment. Um, and find those edge cases and those places you get stuck outside of real live active incidents so that you can talk about them. I love that. Uh, and when you say practice, are you talking about um, like any specific, you know, kind of like gamification or I, I don't know, what, what does that kind of look like? Yeah, yeah. I think like you can build up to running a full fledged game day. There's a lot of different levels of time and energy investment you can do. So anything from like contained, you know, maybe a chaos engineering exercise within a specific team that's never had an incident. Uh, maybe it's like a newer part of your product or something and you want to explore what would happen if this broke and who would we have to communicate to or what might this breaking even look like um, all the way through to a full company, um, like more Sev zero level game day where maybe you're involving your executive team and your PR and your legal team and really walking through like what would a big incident look like for our company? Um, how fast could we get that like initial press statement out or what would we sure. say to our customers? A lot of the time, you know, people might not even realize like how would we talk to our customers? Do we send them an email? Do we use social media? <laughs> like, right. Little Twitter, thing. Yeah surfaced it, when you just actually run through it. Um, now, of course, if you have a real incident, then you're going to get practice in that area really fast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but ideally, you can practice, you know, in a more contained environment before the real thing happens. Sure, sure. No, that makes sense. That's funny. Um, okay, so I'm going to pivot a little bit to what you're currently doing at Rootly. Uh, you're currently leveraging your experience in incident response at this AI startup called Rootly. Uh, could you just tell us in simple terms the problem that Rootly is solving? Yes, definitely. So um, we are an incident response and on-call platform. But the problem that we're really solving is kind of leveling the playing field for great incident response for everybody. So our product is both built and used by people who understand incidents and have managed many of them. And what we do is we take all those things that we've learned and we encode it into a platform that helps you resolve the incident faster. So where mm -hmm. traditionally, you know, you might need to have a bespoke incident response team, you know, that's completely dedicated to building out this program in your company. Unless you're at a very large scale, you're not going to have that type of resources. Sure. So how do we make this accessible to companies of all sizes, of all scales, and make it just really simple to actually detect and manage incidents. 
So would you consider this like a, almost like an incident response assistant, I guess is, is a good way to put it. Like, can you consult about different issues? What does that look like to use the product, I guess, in the day to day? Is it, yeah, you just tell me you're the expert. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, so most people who use Rootly uh, use it actually via Slack rather than in the web app. Oh, okay. So web That's version. convenient. But um, a big benefit is that with Ruli, you can manage your incident end to end in Slack. So a lot of the time we'll find our customers are already managing incidents in Slack um, and they have all of these challenges because of it, because you also have all of your other tools, like where you're pulling your dashboards from sure. and how you're managing your responders and you're drafting comms. Ruli brings all of that together within Slack and then uses AI and automation to expedite things and eliminate toil. So when you start an incident with Rootly, typically you're going to do so in Slack using a slash command. You can type Rootly new. Your incident channel is created. And to give you an idea of like what this looks like, so you'll have like your Zoom or your Google Meet pinned to the channel. You'll have the ability to assign and document roles, tasks, all that easy stuff using just like emojis wow. and built-in um, formatting. You have your Jira ticket spun up with subtasks that are going to sync across the whole platform. It really takes all of that admin toil and kind of in between operational stuff and just takes care of it for you. And then throughout, um, like we said, there's, there's AI elements. So say, you know, the channel's moving fast, you go take a bathroom break, you come back and you're like, oh my God, I've fallen behind. I don't know what's going yeah. on you can ask the AI because it's in there just listening and learning. And I could say, Rootly AI, catch me up. I'm lost. Oh, and that's cool. This conversational element where I can say, you know, hey, they rolled back this PR. It seems to be working, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it's going to get that information from just reading through the incident channel. Um, and then it also learns from all of your incidents historically to give you data insights and help you resolve the next ones faster. I feel like that catch up feature alone is like game changing because I know that's a huge issue with, with keeping up with incidents and alerting, you know, is uh, it's just this constant flow of information. Um, yeah. So much of what's hard about incidents isn't actually resolving the problem. It's like getting all of the moving pieces of your engineers, your customer comms, your execs, your PR, everybody just on the same page and knowing what is going on and, how you're moving towards fixing it. So really, really tackles that and just makes it like really effortless and easy. I'll tell you the other thing I appreciated about your description of it is I love that it's uh, basically built into Slack or integrates with Slack. I don't know how you would phrase that, but um, there's a huge movement for that too, right? Just because I know in incident response as well and in other areas of engineering, there's so many dashboards and so many tools and whatever. And especially at startups, um, I know that there's a huge need to just like, no, we need to be lean. <laughs> We're doing everything in Slack or WebEx or whatever the messaging platform is. I think uh, there was this like perspective that managing incidents in Slack was like a bad habit for some time. And it was one of those things that like, we did it at Shopify. We, lots of companies do it, as you know, like we have hundreds of companies on Rootly that use Slack to manage incidents. And instead of this idea that like, this is a bad habit and a bad way to do it that we have to train people out of. Rootly is really about like, okay, but how do we just make it better? Like, this is where people want to do it. This is where people like to work. Sure. How do we take the things that are maybe problematic? Like, you know, at the end of an incident, you don't have a great timeline. If you've been managing mm -hmm. Slack, you got to scroll back. you got to find all those key moments. It's not going to retain it. Uh, really, I'll do that automatically. It's going to detect those key moments. You can also manually pin them with an emoji. And then the timeline problem is solved. There's no manual scroll back. Like all of these things that, you know, have been maybe criticisms of managing incidents in Slack, I think came from partially just overall skepticism around like distributed working and remote teams. Oh like, yeah, sure. You can't possibly manage an incident. <laughs> Everyone needs to be together in a war room. Um, and that's just not the way people work anymore. So that's what really is about is like, how do modern teams actually work? What is managing an incident? actually look like and how do we build a tool that makes that easier instead of this kind of pretend like old guard incident world that yeah. we don't anymore where everyone's in the war room moving through the NIST phases. Right. This is the new intuitive workflow. You know, this is how I see it is you guys work with how people are intuitively trying to solve this and just improved upon it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of, I know you talked a little bit about how the AI portion of this um, adds value to Rootly, right? Because I, I know one of the 
questions I, I wanted to discuss with you is, you know, <laughs> does AI add value in this case? I know you're not going to say no because you work at Rootly, but, you know, we, we all have seen those products where it's just, you know, the, the little sparkle's been added, there's a chat bot, whatever, and it's not adding a lot of value. Besides things like the catch-up feature, um, summarizing the history of the response, is there anything else that, like, wow, I would say this is a game changer? Yeah, um, something... Not that those aren't already huge game changers because they are. No, totally. And I think like, I exactly get what you mean. I think we see a lot of like AI for the sake of AI. AI in yes. and of itself, it's not a feature if it's not doing something that's useful and meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we were really thoughtful about how and where we incorporate AI into Rootly and something we also do um, because we understand that there is skepticism yeah. around AI and that's fine and fair. Uh, any single AI feature in the platform is optional. You can opt in or out oh, nice. your account settings with a toggle. We we don't force it on people. You can completely use Rootly with no AI if you want to. Obviously, we think the AI features are great and helpful, and the vast majority of our customers choose to use them. Uh, but if not, that's fine too. You have a lot of control. You can bring your own instance. You can choose exactly which Slack channels it can access. It does not ever, ever share um, information, even anonymized, outside of your own organization. So uh, just to kind of call out that we're aware <laughs> of that, you know, skepticism and we're pretty conscious of that. But as far as what the AI does, that's really cool. Something I like because I have a confession and that is that I have tried to learn SQL for <laughs> years <laughs> yeah. and I don't know what it is about SQL. I can't. I just cannot. <laughs> Um, querying languages are just not for me. So uh, something I like about our AI is that you can request reports and dashboards using natural language uh, within the web app. So if I want to pull a report of any sort of, um, you know, maybe I want to see all of our security incidents over six months in order of severity grouped by service, I can just ask the AI to generate that report for me and it will pull it. I do not have to export anything, um, you know, into data tables. I don't have to write a query. I don't have to do any of it. It's just there. <laughs> um, that I love. Wow. No, no, that is amazing as well. No, I think you're not alone in the whole um, learning query languages thing. I mean, I actually do love SQL. I'm not gonna lie, but, uh, um, but I think that's also a godsend. Um, Okay, and I just want to make sure too. You, you can still uh, hear me and see me. Okay, I think we might have had like a little network connection issue. Yeah, I think we, we had a brief little um, okay brief we're good. lag. Moment, but I think we're okay. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Um, so yeah, no, thank you for for explaining in simple terms why people would um, you know use the AI features. And I, and I know too, you guys probably have to answer questions as well around like responsible AI policies and and how data is stored. Is that a big concern as well? Yeah, it can be. Uh, we work with organizations at all different sizes. So, you know, from small startups with instant response teams of like three people to NVIDIA and Cisco, like you said. So we're definitely no stranger to the procurement process and that. And um, Okay, yeah, yeah. I would say lawyers tend to love us when it comes to procurement because oh, wow. they it's just it's so transparent it's really easy to opt in or out uh we don't make people jump through hoops or like file a special exemption request um which is actually something some of our competitors do which i find kind of wild uh if you don't want the ai you just turn it off um you change your mind yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay no that's that's perfect um i i just have a couple last things and i really appreciate all your answers because you are very um not eloquent, but very engaging, very engaging uh, conversationalist. So, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, our developer community is also all about integrations. Uh, what does Rootly's integrations ecosystem look like? Yeah, we love integrations. We keep our garden walls, so to speak, very low because we are very focused on specifically the instant response process. So, if it is a core functionality within instant response, you know, paging, organizing responders. We love that. We focus on it. And that's where we put all of our energy. Anything kind of adjacent outside of the instant response process, you know, observability tooling, collaborative documents, uh, 
that is where integrations come into play. We want people to be able to bring their tech stack, the tools that they love and still use Rootly. Um, we're not interested in like taking that whole DevOps pie. Like we are a very purpose built, laser focused on incident management. So we've got upwards of like 70 integrations now, maybe more. Wow. We're constantly adding them. We're always, um, you know, asking our customers what integrations they want to see. When we get requests, we can usually execute them pretty quickly, to be honest. So we've got tons of integrations. Some of the most popular are our Jira one is a big one. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, auto generate a JIRA issue for your incident and then any tasks with, within your incident, action items, stuff like that. Uh, it creates the subtask for you. It syncs by directionally so you can update it wherever. Wow, yeah. Uh, so issue tracking is really easy. Slack's obviously the big one. Uh, Confluence is great. You can use Confluence, Notion, Google Docs. Like I said, we're not opinionated on that, whatever tool you want to use, but we'll auto generate your retro in the doc tool you choose. And you'll see that across the whole platform. We're pretty. We're extremely opinionated when it comes to incident response and unopinionated on everything else. Use whatever observability. I love that. Want. I mean, I think that reflects the number of integrations you have. And uh, it's all about making people's lives easier, right? And I know that sounds simple, but even just, oh, we listen to our customers and execute quickly. I feel like that's you know a struggle a lot of places. So um, <laughs> fantastic. OK, well, the last thing I wanted to touch on with you today is um, that I know you have a podcast right now called Humans of Reliability. And I did check out a couple episodes. Um, I love the whole premise behind it and the tagline, just to quote it, uh, behind every reliable software system, there are human beings working hard to keep it online. So what inspired you to create this podcast? What inspired me? That's a good question. This is kind of an idea that our CEO, JJ, and I had been playing with for a while. Because one thing we talk about all the time, like it sounds, I don't know, <laughs> it sounds kind of corny, but like in earnest, uh, the people who work in this industry are so interesting. <laughs> like all of our customers are so interesting. We go to tons of conferences and events and I just find myself constantly having these really fascinating and really like human conversations. And I didn't see that reflected in a lot of the reliability content that was out there. It was very technical, you know, it's a 90 minute webinar yeah. on containerization and you're like, sure this is great content and it's useful, but I wanted, I, I felt like there was a bit of a gap in showing that like, there's also just a lot of interesting people. Um, and even though SRE and infrastructure engineering is, is really technical. And I think like kind of intimidating, um, or maybe just like unsexy, like <laughs> I think people are, yeah. you know, okay. Infra infrastructure. Cool. <laughs> like, uh, I think that, if you actually get to talking about incident response in a broader sense and reliability, there's a lot of um, like people problems within it and yes, yes. people. And I just wanted to kind of show that to the world because I feel like that's something I get to see that not that many people do. And I just like wanted to put it forth in the world that people should understand like how the internet works and the people who work on it. It's, it's cool and interesting to me. At least. Sure. No. And even, even with the folks within um, infrastructure engineering or security, I, I see this come up constantly, actually, since I started uh, talking to podcast guests is that there is this huge focus on the technical side and, and we're somewhat devoid of those human conversations and the people problems within the space. And I don't know if what that is, if that's, I don't know, some sort of stigma or something, but um I mean, that's part of why I really love what you're doing here, because I think it's really needed and hopefully it inspires the people side of these technical fields um, to be just as important, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I hope that, you know, people who are maybe curious about the industry, but not actively working in it or maybe just getting sure. started in it can see things like this and feel a little bit less intimidated to ask questions and meet people. Um because I was like really intimidated when I first started. I remember Same. Um, the first time I met like Niall Murphy, who like in reliability is like a god. And then I met him and I was like, he's like the nicest dad. Like, <laughs> I was scared. Um, and now I've talked to him a bunch and he's just a really kind guy. And he's just like one of the many, many people who people really admire and look up to in this industry uh, because of their technical knowledge. But they're also just like, kind and interesting right, humans are curious about it you should talk to them 
Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I think it's there's something that's just, uh, there's like this perception of like being geniuses or robots almost. And, yeah. um, and, they're gonna and I, I really don't think it's that way. Most of the they're going to think I'm stupid and yes. the questions are a waste of time. Um, and that has never been my experience. I didn't come into reliability or anything from a technical background. Um, so like there was a time when I was Googling what is Kubernetes like in a meeting. Yeah. So, don't be afraid to ask questions. People are happy to share what they know. And the fact, I just want to say one other thing is that uh, even when you're in the field for a long time or whatever your technical field is, there's so much learning and things evolve so quickly that people today are still Googling Kubernetes, right? Because they're just, we're not all using all the same skills and at all the same time. So uh, totally. that's a great point. It just so fast. There's always something new to learn. Somebody I interviewed, um, Samil, I think it was from Air Call on my podcast, was telling me like he finished his computer science degree the year before the internet was invented, and he was like, "Well, that was wow." <laughs> <laughs> but so, that's how that's you know. how it is, though. I think it, in working in tech, I mean, I I feel like I hear this sentiment sometimes at Cisco. We get people who ask in infrastructure engineering, "Oh, should I still learn?" automation because now there's AI, like, will AI do things for me or will AI take my job? And, and also, you know, I think in a lot of senses, we don't even really have clear answers for people, you know, it's just, oh, totally. you know, yeah. things are evolving and you try to stay on top of it and you see where it goes, you know, I know you feel like you get finally start to wrap your head around one thing, like, you know, DevOps and what it encompasses. And then suddenly they're like, DevOps is dead. It's platform engineering now. And you're oh, like, yes. <laughs> Yeah, or whatever acronym they have or buzzword they, they come yes, up with at the time. Exactly. Which it's fun once you know what it is. It makes you feel really smart and cool, but there are a lot of buzzwords. So, yeah, and they, they constantly change. So, yeah, <laughs> that's tech. That's one of the great things about it, though. Uh, well, I am going to link to your podcast in the description of this video. And this has been an absolute pleasure, Ashley. I'm so glad you came on here to talk with us. Um, yeah, I, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Um, and yeah, viewers should all check out this podcast because you've talked to, you've listened to Ashley now and you know it's going to be some quality-ish. Um, so anyway, thank you again and uh, talk to everybody later. Thank you so much, Erica. It's been a pleasure.